Hey, good morning, everybody. It is uh, great to be with you. If you are new with us, watching online, or it's happened to be new here in the room, and I'm Charlie, the lead pastor here, and really glad you're worshiping. And this is kind of one of those Sundays, kind of a weird Sunday. I mean, I guess I don't remember the last time there wasn't a weird Sunday. They're all, they're all weird now, but there, there's these times that happen, and um, where, where something happens in our world, and, or something happens in our state, or something happens in the U.S., where... It just kind of just, you know, it just seems like everything just kind of stops and the world just seems broken there for a while. And that's happened this week uh, with, with the death of, of George Floyd and the protests that are going on everywhere. And there's this, there's this pressure that I feel. And um, there's this pressure that I feel like people have already asked, like, I mean, are you going you gonna, to gonna say something? And there's this pressure that you feel like you have to say some, you have to just say just the right thing. You have, what you have to say has to be perfect, and 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 it, and it can feel like you're walking into kind of a bit of a of a landmine because again, everything that's political, everything's political now, right? So whatever it is I say next is is your even if you're not trying to, uh, you're going to try to you're going to try to pin me down to some sort of political point of view. But the interesting thing about this pressure that I feel to say the right thing is I don't think that I'm the only person that has felt this. In fact, I've had some conversations this week with some people where it's like, you know, this is, is, this is all just so awful. I feel sad. I feel frustrated. I don't know what to say. I feel like I should say something. I feel like I should, maybe I should post something about it because I, I like and and there's this sense in which well I think I'm the only reason I would do that is because I want people to know that I'm on the on the right side of this and 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 there's just all of this anguish about it and you add to that that our world hasn't been right for the last uh, three months or so and there's just a lot of weird emotions and anxiety and and fear and things that we feel. And we start to ask, well, what is it? What is it I can do? What do I, is is there is there something that I'm supposed to do? I have this overwhelming sadness. I I, I feel angry, and we and we want to know, and and we'll, as if there's like this monolithic one. This is the Christian right response to this, and we feel that kind of pressure. When really, I think it's just one. It's just, it's just okay to be sad. It's okay to be angry. It's okay to be frustrated. And I think it's important to give a little perspective to it because I think that I think a lot of it um, comes from the fact that I, I still think that there's this thing that we have in us, in each one of us, where we continue to be surprised by how broken the world is. Like if I said that, that, that the world is broken, you say, sure, but it's not, it's not that broken. And then something happens, a pandemic happens, or just... Just an awful video of just an awful murder. And, and, and it's like, but it's not, it's not that broken. And I think a lot of it just comes from just this overwhelming sense of anguish and fear that not only is the world broken, but there really isn't, doesn't seem like there's anything that we can do about it. And that's something that we all have to process because the world is really, really broken. And there isn't really anything we can do to make it unbroken. That's not the same as there's not things that we can do. Don't hear me say that. But there is this sense in which I think that it's, this is, it, it needs to draw all of us to this idea that the only hope that we have in this world or the next is found in Jesus. There is no, there's no American ideal that can, that can come across. There's no collective thing that we can do as a world that is going to bring the real hope that this world needs. And um, so I think it's important for us as followers of Christ to kind of lean on that and, and, and to really kind of let that, like, like the real, like we, we have all these safety nets in our world. It's like, well, if this fails, this happens. If this, if this. And the real safety net is that I have hope and faith and life in the Son of God, Jesus Christ. I'm quarantined and the world is broken and there's anger and there's injustice everywhere but God, but God has me. And I think there's a sense in which that we, we need to be a little bit more comfortable uh, laying at peace in the only real safety net that we have in this world. But in addition, you know, people ask, is there something we can do? And I, and I, and I talk to people who, who just feel like, 
that they don't really they don't really don't understand. They don't only really understand this level of anger. They don't understand. They don't they don't perceive the U.S. They don't perceive this you know our, our little part of the world as a necessarily unjust place. You don't really have to fight for justice here because we live in America. And the thing that I would do is I would just encourage you if you come from that perspective. I would just encourage you to talk to somebody from a different perspective. Because there are people of other uh, social economic classes, and there's certainly people of other races that have just a completely different perspective. And it's okay that you have your perspective. It's okay that you see the world the way that you do. I mean, you, you, ha- you, are, a, you are the collection of your own experiences. But there are another group of people out there, other groups of people out there that have a completely different set of experiences. And I think one of the best things that we can do is learn to listen and learn to do more than listen, but to proact- proactively try to hear other voices and to make sure that we really do have a more balanced perspective on the way this world works, the way that our little world works, the way that our community works, the way that our country works. And it's okay. But I think one of the things that we've really lost right now, and you just see this, all you have to do is flip, just pick any two news stations you want, cable news networks, and just go back and forth between them. Go back and forth between their websites, and you'll be convinced of two completely different worlds out there, and they're all theoretically reporting on the same one. And um, a little bit we have lost the ability to really hear what other people are going through, other people's perspectives, and to really feel and understand other people's pain and frustration. And if you want to bring a little bit of hope to this world, if you want to bring a little peace to this world, if you want to bring justice to this world, I am fully convinced that is one of the things that we're going to have to figure out how to do, which is to just learn to love and listen better to people. We can't have conversations anymore. We can't disagree anymore. We can't discuss things anymore. We can't understand things because we just we're we're so angry and we're so frustrated and we we hate so much the people who stand on the other side and so we live in fear and isolation and only talk to people who think like me I only read things that are people think the people that think like me and I become so so isolated and so frustrated that it's hard to say that the world is getting more broken but we're certainly not doing anything else to make it better And so I would encourage you. I mean, there's some things that God has called us to do. He has called us to be people who bring hope, peace, and he's also called us to be people who bring justice to those who feel like that they need an advocate. Um, All throughout the Old Testament, you'll see God saying that that God had a special place in his heart for widows, orphans, and, 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 and aliens, was the word, or strangers, foreigners, people from other lands. And the reason was is because those people in that country, they didn't have the kind of property rights and economic rights that other people did. And God said, the people who have the least amount of rights in this society, I have a special heart for. And you need to make sure that if, if you are the one who has the special privileges, that you're doing everything that you can to advocate for those who don't. And I would just encourage you to be that kind of person. I would encourage you to be the kind of person that is a carrier of hope and the peace that God gives. And again, this is not to say that we don't grieve. This is not to say that it's not okay to be upset. Um, But as the passage we looked at in Thessalonians a few weeks back says, when it's talking about death and it's just talking about how broken and awful the world is, we grieve, but we don't grieve like people who don't have hope. And so we want to be people who are bringing hope, and we want to be people who have hope. And so as always... And if you need somebody to talk to about this, if you need to just to pray about this, if you need to be somebody who can just, you can just yell at for a little bit, I, I volunteer to be that person to just kind of help you process. If you process better with an email or a text or a call or whatever. Um, we want to be known as people who are advocating for people who need advocates and that we are bringing hope and life and love to a world um, that is in short supply. And we do all of that Uh, Because we have hope in Jesus Christ, who gives us hope in this world and in the next. Let me pray for us. God, I thank you for your son. I thank you in a world that is just overwhelmingly broken. God, that we can lean on you. God, that we can trust in you, that we can have hope and life in you. 
And God, I pray that we would just put all our political fear aside, our political anxiety aside. I pray that we would, we would just stop having sides. God, I just, if there's anything, God, I just pray that as your people, we would just be on collectively your side and that God that we would advocate for things that even make us uncomfortable that we would that we would that we would bring hope to people who need it that God that we can just put aside so many different things in order to bring hope and love to this world this world needs grace this world needs forgiveness this world needs your son Jesus Christ in a, in, a, in an awesome way and so, God, I just pray for everybody individually here, everybody individually who's listening, that, God, that we really would be able to rest in the hope that your Son gives, and that, God, that we would be carriers of that hope to a world and to individuals around us that desperately need it. And we love you, God. And it's in your Son's name that we pray. Amen. All right, so we're in parables here, and uh, we're in, uh, in Matthew chapter 18. This is actually one of my most favorite parables in the world. There's just so many layers to it here that I think it's really powerful, and I also think that it is one of the most foundational principles. Some of the principles we're going to leave here with today are some of the ones that I think that are the most foundational to help us understand what it really means to walk in a relationship with God. And it all starts with a question That Peter asks in Matthew chapter 18, verse 21. Peter says this Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times? Jesus answered, I tell you, not seven times, but 77 times, or seven or 77s. Some people think he may be saying 77, some people think he may be 77s, like 490. But the idea here is, is that Peter comes to Jesus and he thinks, how many times am I supposed to forgive somebody? Like somebody keeps doing something over and over again. How many times am I supposed to give? And the idea at that time was kind of like, like, like three's the limit. Three's the limit. And so he thought, he was like, man, I know Jesus. He's all like all Jesus-y and sweet and kind and stuff and like got to be all gracious. And he's like, he's like he thought, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to double it and then add a little bit. How many times am I supposed to give? And then plus like seven's like one of those Bible numbers, right? And so it's like, it's like seven. That seems like the perfect. Like am I supposed to do like seven so I think he thought he was going to get a pat on the back for how gracious he was willing to be. And I'm not saying Jesus is an eye roller, like he's an eye rolling at Peter here. But he, he's like, not, not seven, like, he's like, since he's like, like all the sevens, like just nonstop sevens. And so he's not really saying, I mean, he did literally say 77 or 77s, like uh, whatever. But even still, what he's getting at here, he's not, he's, it's not a number, Right? And so there are people out there, I swear to you, there are. There are people out there, man, they got, they got, they got notebooks. And, um, and then when they hit 77, man, they're, they're, their private little world is just going to blow up, right? They're going to they're gonna tell somebody, they're going to put like, I, the, the list, this number 78. I'm taking you down, right? And, and, and there are people like that. That's not the point. The point is essentially unlimited forgiveness. And he makes that point in this parable, verse 23. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. As he began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 bags of gold was brought to him. Since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. At this, the servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged, and I will pay back everything. The servant's master took pity, pity on him, canceled the debt, and let him go. But when that servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred silver coins. He grabbed him and began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. His fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him, Be patient with me and I will pay it back. But he refused. Instead, he went off and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. When the other servants saw what had happened, they were outraged and went and told their master everything that had happened. Then the master called the servant in. You wicked servant, he said. I canceled all that debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? In anger, his master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all he owed. This is how my heavenly Father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother and sister 
from your heart. So again, there are a lot of layers to this story, and there's a lot of details to this that if we don't really understand kind of what, what they would have heard when he said this, we'll, we'll miss out. And so it starts with this king, and this king who, um, he's got this servant, and he's coming to, to come essentially collect debts. And there's this one servant that says that, that this, the, this guy owed the king 10,000 bags of gold. And so the, 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 the word there, uh, is t- the, the measure there is really talents, 10,000 talents. And talents is less an amount of currency, but it is, it is, it is a weight and so the best way to explain what this is, I mean, essentially, I've, I've, done the, I've done the math on this, is it is essentially what you would earn if you worked for 40,000 years. If you worked for 40,000 years, an average person worked for 40,000 years, you would earn about this much. And so, you know, if you, if, if you, take, into, uh, uh, you take into account the, um, the inflation rate, uh, my best calculation of this, this is like a bazillion dollars. And that really honestly is the point of what Jesus is saying, because he's talking to, he's not talking to a middle class group, he's talking to, he's talking to a relatively impoverished group of people, and essentially saying, more money than you probably believe exists in the world is what this guy owed the king. And I think it's important for us to process that because essentially what he was saying is a number so large that the people who were saying could not comprehend it. We're getting a little bit better as there are billionaires and we talk about trillion dollar budgets and these kinds of things, trillion dollar stimulus. We're hearing these numbers, but it's like we still can't process that. If I said a trillion dollars, how much is a trillion dollars? And can you imagine having a trillion dollars? What would you do with a trillion dollars? And imagine you had a trillion dollars and you spent it all and you owed it. That's the situation that this guy in. And, and this we talked about this last week if you were here. The, the, the God figure in all of these parables always has something in them that is so ridiculous that it doesn't make sense. Because in order to explain the love of God, you have to use an outrageous example. And so we see that here, and the first point that I want to make about it is that God has been overwhelmingly gracious to you. And make sure we're going to use a couple of different words here. Grace is you get something good that you don't deserve. That is grace. And so imagine a situation where this guy, he's probably like, like he's got to be pretty up there in the court of the king to have this level of access. He's like, excuse me, king. I need one bag of gold. Like, what do you need a bag of gold for? I've got gold things to do with it. I need to do something with my house, or I need to do something with servants. I need to do something with the crops, or whatever. I need a bag of gold. Okay, well, here's a bag of gold. He comes back again. and comes like, I need, I need five more bags of gold. Well, for what? Well, you know, something happened with the first one, whatever. Okay, here's five. I need 100 bags. I mean, at what point does the king be like, Dude, you've got a spending problem. You're a terrible businessman. You lose things. You're unlucky. I'm going to cut you off at 500 bags of gold, 1,000 bags of gold, 5,000. He just kept lending him more money. I mean, it is, it is, it is, it is again, this level of money, there probably was not a king alive at this time that had that amount of money. And, and, and that's what makes this story so crazy. But essentially what the king is doing and what God is doing is saying, I'm just going to continue to just kind of, I'm, I'm going to continue to kind of let you do this. And um, we, we say this, we say, and, and again, I hate, I, hate, I hate that this is going to be tied up with some of the things I said earlier. But, you know, we, we get frustrated sometimes with God that God is not bringing justice now. We get frustrated with God that he's not, you know, taking care of evil now. Be just now. Take care of evil. Do it, do it now. And we think about that only in terms of he's, when God is being gracious to the wrong people. Right? When God's being gracious to the wrong people, there's something wrong with God. When God's being gracious with me, God is good. Right? God's gracious with you, 
that's a flaw in God's character. God is gracious with me, then we sing a worship song, right? And the, and the reality of it is, we've got to put our mind around here a little bit how overwhelmingly gracious God has been. You know, so again, the money here is sin. It's like, God, I'm going to do some sin, and God doesn't take you out. I, I, I did that sin. I need a little bit more sin. I'm going to do some more sin. And I'm just going to keep doing more and more and more. And God is just continuing to just kind of let it happen. But then the next thing happens. The next thing happens, which is, you know, he's like, well, now, now it's time. Now is the time for the king. Now it's time for God to bring justice. He's like, you owe all of this. And so the punishment of this is you have to go to debtor's prison. And again, in order to pay off debtor's prison, you would have to essentially live 40,000 years. So we're going to put your family in there too. And so between the four of you, then you'd have to do 10,000 years each. Well, essentially, then your kids, grandkids, your great-grandkids, your great-great-grandkids are going to have to live in debtor's prison forever because you're not going to be able to pay this back. But this is the punishment. I was gracious with you. I continue to lend you money. I continue to believe in you. But now the punishment is here. And, and the guy says, and it's, this... Verse 29, his fellow, uh, it, it, oh, sorry, verse 26, be patient with me, he begged, and I will pay back everything. Now, King got to giggle here just a little bit, right? I, I, I was here the whole time. I, I, I was the one that gave you all 10,000 bags of, those, of that gold. I did, I, would, I did that. I was there. You, it's impossible. Like, what are you going to do? Like, well, there's nothing that you can do. And he's just begging. But something about that captivated this king, this, this, this humility, I guess, or, or whatever. And, and the king forgives him. He's like, okay, fine. I will wipe it all out. So not, not only has God been overwhelmingly gracious to us and to allow us to rack up the debt, we have received overwhelming mercy and forgiveness. We see the overwhelming mercy and forgiveness. Mercy, again, okay, grace is I'm going to be good to you when you don't deserve it. Mercy is I'm going to not be bad to you when you do deserve it. So mercy is you deserve a punishment, I'm going to hold, take it back. And so, and, so, and so God, the king here says, you, you say you're going to pay it back, you're not. I will just forgive that debt. I will just forgive it. And... Um, and, and I think what needs to happen next in all of our minds is this. Because again, what you think about this is going to determine a lot about your relationship with God now and in the future. Do you really believe that you are the original servant in this story? Do you believe that your sin has racked up an equivalent debt with God such that the only way to describe it is to talk about you owe God $10 trillion. You owe God a quadrillion dollars. You owe God all the money that exists in the world times four. That's how much your sin has racked up a debt against God. Now, there's, there's some things right now that you're battling with in your own heart and mind right now that want to give some measure of objection to that. My sin is not that bad. I mean, murderers, rapists, human traffickers, yes, I understand that, but my debt cannot be described that way. Because I am a good person. And I promise you, this parable was said to a good person. To good people. He was saying this to Peter. This was not something he, this was, not something he was proclaiming at the jail. This was not something that he was proclaiming in the, in the, in the Roman palace where the, 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 the oppressors were there. These, these were not the people who were owning slaves. This was Peter he was talking to. He was describing this to Peter, 
the one who ultimately kind of was like the, the head guy. He like he, he, after Jesus kind of founded the church, he was kind of the, the head apostle there for a while. He's Peter. I mean, sure, he made some mistakes. I mean, he, got, he, he back-talked Jesus that one time, and he denied Jesus a couple of times. He, he sliced off that servant's ear that one time. I mean, 100,000 bucks? I don't know. 50,000 bucks? I mean, maybe something, but not that. But in order for Jesus to communicate to Peter the level of debt that he had because of his sin with God, this is what he communicated to him. Because there's an interesting thing that Jesus says in the scriptures, you see it all throughout, really cover to cover, this idea that the one who is forgiven a little is gracious a little, is, is grateful a little, and the one who's forgiven a lot is, is a lot grateful. And how well you identify with the person in this story, my debt with God was in fact severe. It does not matter that maybe my debt is $1 trillion and your debt is $2 trillion. My $1 trillion is huge. It's not about relative scores. And it's not about this. And this is, again, a misunderstanding of the word grace and mercy. Grace and mercy, these things, they have ideas that there's nothing that I did to deserve it. But there has to be in this guy some sense in which he walked away from the king thinking... I'm awesome. So he runs up this huge debt. He begs for he begs to let he just be patient with him. Let me pay it back, even though it was a ridiculous thing to say. And instead of saying, "Sure, I'll give you some more time to pay it back," he just forgives the debt. You can walk out of that situation thinking one of two things. You can walk out of it thinking, "Man, I must be really, really awesome if the king will do this for me." I'm really smart, I'm great, I'm awesome. The king must really love me. I've got a lot of good qualities. He really couldn't stand to see me in prison. I'm great, and that's why this king did it. Or you walk out of that situation and you say, this king is amazing. How loving and gracious and kind is this king. And I think too often... After time, the further maybe we get away from the reality of what it really means that God forgave our sins through Jesus, certainly the further away we get from that moment, the more we think, I'm great, and we lose that God is great. So according to this story, it seems like he loses sight of this almost immediately. He loses sight of it almost immediately. And it says that what he did, when that servant went out... He found one of his fellow servants. He didn't stumble across him. He went out and looked for him. So now he's got this attitude, this attitude that says, I am the king's most favorite person in the world because he just forgave a trillion dollar debt to me. And I, 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 I'm gold. I am, I, I, am, I am bulletproof. And what he does is he takes this newfound uh, place that he believes that he has And he begins to immediately take advantage of somebody else with it. And he goes to this person and says, You owe me a hundred denarii is basically what this is. And again, it's just to do the math on it. You earned one of these every day. So this is equivalent of a one-third of your annual salary. So let's be clear. This is not a small amount of money. One-third of your annual salary, no matter who you, who you are, if someone owes you that, that is a lot of money to you and a lot of money to them. This is a significant sum that this person owes him. But in light of what had just happened, you have just been, you've just been brought from being a trillion dollars in the hole to now being forgiven. And I'm assuming he's got some equity in something with the money that he got. And so rather than being in this situation where it's like, Man, you will not believe what the king did to me, bro. It does not matter. You just, you just keep the hundred denarii. It's good. I'm good. This is the best thing that has ever happened to me. It says he chokes him out. God's been overwhelmingly gracious to you, and you've received overwhelming mercy and forgiveness, and you should forgive in a way that also feels overwhelming. 
It should feel, you should be forgiving so much that it seems weird. You know, if it come up to you and it's like, again, whatever a third of your salary is, if you were to forgive somebody who owed you $10,000, $20,000, $30,000, whatever that number is, they owe you that, and you just say, it's no big deal, you just, you just keep the money I gave you. We're not talking about 10 bucks, we're not talking about 50 bucks, we're not talking about 100 bucks. I'm like, I'm going to lend somebody 1,000 bucks, right? I mean, we're not talking about, we're talking about one third of your salary. That's a lot of money. If, if that story were just in isolation, this would be, that would be an incredibly gracious person to forgive that much. And so it should feel like it's costing you something. That's the kind of forgiver that you need to be. But the point that Jesus is making is that if you think about it, it's really not that much at all in comparison to what God has done for you. And so we get a little bit off with this parable because we, don't, we either don't believe that we owed God the big debt or we magnified debts against us. And then I, 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 just, I, I just can't, like, I, I'm, 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 in both situations, I'm too great. I'm too great, so I haven't really been forgiven that much. I'm too great, and your debt against me is severe because of me. And what God is saying here, what Jesus is trying to communicate is, no, your debt is severe. God is the great one. Go be gracious in the way that God has been gracious with you. Now, I always feel like I need to give one small caveat, and, then, and for most of you, you, don't, you just need to pretend I didn't say it. If you're in an abusive relationship, the forgiving of abuse looks very different. You can forgive and be at peace with your heart, but you need to flee abusive situations. But let's just, and, and, and if you are in that situation, I beg you, reach out for help. There are hundreds of people in this church that would love to help you get into a safe place. But for most of us, that's not the situation that we're in. The situation that we're in is we're like Peter and we think, I forgive you seven times. In fact, we're not even Peter, right? What's the phrase? Fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. That means like, I'll forgive you one time ish and Jesus is saying we need to have an unlimited capacity for forgiveness in, refle- to, in order to reflect the overwhelming forgiveness of a gracious merciful God so this is the kind of thing it's easy to say and get up here to spend a few minutes and say God forgave you a lot agree yes you should forgive too agree yes now the hard work happens in our hearts now when you think about that particular person that you're holding the, the, the grudge with, when you're, hold, when, 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 when you're sitting next to them, but there's this huge gap between you, or it's that person in your family or a friend that you've not talked to in weeks, months, years, because of that thing that they did to you. But God is calling us to model this level of mercy and love and forgiveness in this world. So as we reflect and worship, and I encourage you to, to worship, to, to reflect, we have, we have our response area in the back. I encourage you to create your living room, a response area, to just to, to, to pray, to get on your knees, to cry, to think, to just give God, help God just kind of overwhelm you with the mercy and the compassion that you need to be this kind of person in this world. Because again, this is what this world needs. This world needs a little bit more of God's grace and his compassion. And again, I hate, I hate, again, I don't I necessarily want it to get muddled with stuff we talked about before. But compassion and understanding and forgiveness and kindness would have helped every step of this situation that our world has found itself in this last week. Oh yeah, th- this guy committed a crime, but that doesn't mean that I get to do whatever. Well, and, and there's injustice in this world. That doesn't mean I get to do whatever. We want to be advocates for justice, but we want to also be, we desperately need to be people who are bringing love and mercy 
and forgiveness to a world that just doesn't even seem to know what that is anymore. So let's do the hard work with God right now and ask him to help. Help us reflect his love to the world. Let me pray.